Hello, welcome to Hot Issues. As part of our conversations with eminent Ghanaians on the anti-corruption fight on TV3, today we're privileged to have with us the boss or the commissioner of the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice to have a one-on-one -on -one with us. Uh, Joseph Wittal is our guest on Hot Issues. Good afternoon, sir, and thanks very much for having us in your space like this. You're very welcome. Tremendous. When we talk about the fight against corruption, there are many people uh, who look at the institutions of state and the roles they play in the fight against corruption. From your position as a commissioner of SHRA, do you get the sense that Ghana, as a country, we are winning the anti-corruption fight? Well, from my perspective, it's not about winning, but whether we are making progress. And I think we're making progress. Um, it, it could be more, it could be better, mm. but I think for now, sitting where I sit and looking at the implementation of the NACAP, there is evidence that we are gradually making progress. So let's talk through that progress you you talk about. I mean, I I know that the implementation of the National Anti-Corruption uh, Plan has been ongoing and various uh, state institutions are supposed to play a part. Uh, but when you say progress, exactly how do we measure that progress, whether it's a positive progress or it's a negative progress? You're referring to a positive progress, right? Yeah, definitely, definitely it's positive. In the sense that we have been implementing the, the National Anti-Corruption Action Plan for the past five years. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, we have seen improvement in terms of the actions and activities undertaken by state institutions mm -hmm. to mainstream corruption fighting within the institutions. There is evidence of those activities which we have recorded in mm -hmm. the, the annual progress reports and we had the opportunity to launch the 2018 version at the Anti-Corruption and Transparency Week uh, a short while ago. Mm. And what has been your role in all of this? The role of the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice? The role of the Commission is basically one to facilitate the implementation mm. and to coordinate the implementation by all state actors, private actors, civil society bodies, and in fact, everybody. We coordinate the activities and we receive the reports and then we synthesize, analyze, and put out the reports. And are you happy with your, your, the progress within your institution at the implementation? Uh, within my institution, uh, there is improvement. Mm. One, because if you look at the objectives, the strategic objectives of the National Anti-Corruption Action Plan, one is that we should build the capacity of state anti-corruption bodies. And I can, I mean, I am on firm ground when I tell you that there is very serious improvement in terms of the capacity of the commission, mm. resource-wise, human resource and financial. So, I mean, resource-wise, it means the commission has been uh, a little bit more resource now than previously. Definitely. Which is making you more efficient at your work. More efficient. The capacity is being built. We have a lot of programs that are building the capacity of the investigators and legal officers in terms of how to do effective investigations. Mm -hmm. And... I think it has not been like that in the past. I want you to use this position of you having risen through the ranks to give us a fair assessment of what you think has been the levels of commitments from governments. I mean, I don't want to focus on one government. The levels of commitments of governments to the anti-corruption fight. Do you think it has been good? I think it has been good. One, um, it was in the previous government mm. that we actually had the NACAP developed, launched, and the beginnings of its implementation. Mm. And then we also had the present government coming to take it up because uh, there is a directive from the Ministry of Finance that every state institution must budget adequately 
for the implementation of NACA. Of course, we have challenges with the flow of funds, and so quite a number of funds could not go to other people. But I must say the commitment is there. Then when it comes to the you know, resourcing anti-corruption bodies, I've given the example of the commission. I do know that there's a lot of resources that have also gone into the other anti-corruption bodies. And that is a testament to the fact that there is the will mm. to fight corruption. There, there is demonstrable will demonstrable. that governments are willing yeah. to, to clamp down on corruption. Yes. I, I usually don't like to pitch uh, state institutions against each other. For example, the Office of the Special Prosecutor was created with a purpose in mind to uh, fight high, uh, high crime and in, in high crime in society. Mm -hmm. Do you get the sense that the creation of the office was relevant and whether from the inception of the office it has had good progress? I'll come from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. That under the NACA, there's provision for a national anti-corruption authority. That authority anticipated under the NACAP was supposed to be totally independent, not the situation that we find ourselves now, that practically the Office of the Special Prosecutor is working on delegated powers of the Attorney General. So that was anticipated. And if there are drawbacks, it is possibly because the full implementation of the OSP under NACAP did not take place. Yeah. But well, what, will, what will full implementation mean? Full implementation is the recommendation, I mean, the activities set out in the National Anti-Corruption mm. Action Plan is to ensure that there is an independent national authority responsible for prosecuting mm. corruption. Yeah. So a national corruption authority, mm. independent, preferably under the constitution. That is not the situation mm. as it is now. Mm. And so what do you want to see change with the operations of the Office of the Special Prosecutor? I must say the, 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 the lawyers and other people who crafted that law have done a good job. You still think that the Office of Special Prosecutor is relevant? I think it's very relevant. Very, very relevant. It is a focused approach to ensuring deterrence in the fight against corruption. Mm. The issue of an authority focused on specifically prosecuting corruption would take away the huge uh, pressure on the Attorney General who has to prosecute all crimes, including corruption. So if the Office of the Special Prosecutor is well resourced with sufficient human resource and financial I'm very convinced that we will see a change. Mm, I know that the conversation we're having on the Office of Special Prosecutor has focused on that, but there are other state uh, institutions like the Auditor General's Office yeah. and all of that, uh, the Public Procurement Authority. These are all institutions that are supposed to work together to ensure transparency in uh, public transactions and things related to fighting corruption. Overall, if we look at the relationship between these state agencies, your commission, and the relationship between the commission and the Office of the Special Prosecutor and other bodies. Is it good? Oh, it's very good. Uh, very, very good. One, because we are bound to work together. If you look at the, the charge and the Auditor General, the Constitution requires, one, that if, we, if there is any complaint, allegations of access declaration, non-compliance or contravention, we should request the access declaration from, of that public officer, from the Auditor General. So by law, he's supposed to work closely with us. And he's been doing that. In fact, it takes less than two weeks when we make a request. Mm. And I think that is very, very good. Now, when you come to the uh, Office of the Special Prosecutor, we have had the opportunity to work with him. Anytime there is, we are doing an investigation, 
that we have read in the newspapers that he may be may be involved or he may be also starting an, uh, his own type of investigation. We write and inform him or we call him up. We are at that level where we can call him and find out, are you, uh, are you doing this? Are you in, involved in this investigation? And he said, no. Or, yes, I am. Then we follow it up with the writing. Mm. I've heard all the media issues concerning whether he's doing well and he's not doing well. But I can assure you that if he is actually given the resources to work, and if he's having the cooperation of the state institutions, who should cooperate with him? He's complained about that. Mm. Mm. I mean, look, his contribution to the fight against corruption will be seriously improved. Will be phenomenal. I agree. Let's go back to the implementation of the National Anti-Corruption uh, Plan. I know that you've spoken a lot about it in the beginning of our conversation, but beyond that, yeah. do you see that uh, it is the panacea to resolving all the corruption challenges this country faces? Well, again, um, I'm, I'm careful with issues like panacea, mm -hmm. no. But to the extent that, for once, we have a strategy. A working document. A working document that incorporates everybody. Civil society, private, private sector, state, everybody. The media, faith-based. Everybody has a role to play. If we all play our roles well, and we get the political will to implement NACA. It takes time to change, you know, certain things. Change attitudes? Change perceptions? Attitudes are part of it. Mm. Indeed, if you look at the activities under the NACA, under the three or four strategic objectives, one is cultural renewal. Mm. It's about our culture and our attitudes that somehow conflict with some of the do's and don'ts in the fight against, against corruption. corruption. Gift giving is an issue. Among others, uh, appreciation, the thank you. I mean, within our culture, we don't see that as a problem. Mm. But that can easily escalate and can easily be abused. Mm. So how do you walk the fine line between a cultural issue like gift giving and thank you and ensuring that public officers do not take advantage of their office to demand for public services. Does the, action, does the action plan say, say how? It, it has that. It mm. has that. It has uh, one of the activities which we will be taking on mm. from next year onwards is national cultural renewal. Indeed, we have begun it a bit this year with sensitization of the National House of Chiefs, regional houses of chiefs, We've done all that. And the signal is, look, no culture is, you know, static. There comes a time you have to review how your culture, your tradition impacts on society. And the present situ situation where we find ourselves, where public service is practically used as a basis for demanding, uh, you know, thank you before the service is rendered or after it is rendered, we should be seen to be given the public officer who it is, whose duty it is to even provide the service in the first instance. This is something that we need to fight. This is Hot Issues. I'm Stephen Enti and I'm with uh, Joseph Wittal, the Commissioner, Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Hot Issues. I'm Stephen Enti and seated with me in the hot seat is uh, Joseph Wittal, who is the Commissioner, the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice. We've spoken a lot about the uh, implementation of the National Anti-Corruption Plan. Yeah. Uh, and you, you have told us it's made progress and the progress mm. is good. And you feel that beyond that document, mm. there is more we can, we can achieve. But I want to come down to uh, you. 
Yeah. What kind of leader are you for yeah. the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice? And what difference do you bring to the Commission? Well, as a leader, I've been, to start with, I've been with the Commission for almost um, 27 years as a staff. So I know the issues of the Commission very well. Key among them is staff welfare. I'm talking of internal. And so that is an area I'm working hard, ensuring that we, we, we correct the, the dynamics there. Uh, fortunately, we've been able to convince government to uh, hive off the lawyers from the single spine and uh, put them on the same salary with the attorney general, state attorneys and uh, the lower bench. And we are working out the modalities with Minister of Finance. That's a plus. That's a good thing. You need to work with people who will be, uh, let me say, fulfilled and happy to work. The conditions are changing. You'd see um, across the window, you, 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 I think when you were coming in, you saw the, the ultra-modern four-story that is being built. Uh, offices, auditorium, committee rooms, and all that to uh, replace the bent uh, parts of the old parliamentary chamber. And I think that is progress. As a leader, I feel happy that I'm able to bring my staff along, give them some bit of comfort, make things easier for them. And to the larger public. This commission has, is, I would say, is, is, is a mega commission. Three mandates that otherwise would have been in other countries, three different institutions. It's a pleasure to be able to, to lead that. In fact, delegations upon delegations come trying to look at the model for very good reasons. Because there is connectivity between human rights and administrative justice. In fact, under the Ghanaian constitution, administrative justice is a fundamental human right. Right? Then there is a link between human rights and corruption. Because where the public uh, purse is raided by public servants who are supposed to use that money to provide public service, human rights stand affected. We're talking about practical situations where hospitals and roads and uh, schools ought to be built. If that money is spirited away through corruption, definitely there's a, there's, there's a link between corruption and human rights. Mm -hmm. So to, to have the opportunity to work seamlessly you know, through these three broad mandates, which are big governance teams, um, and and to 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 have the opportunity of your your peers in the world appreciate and come to study what we do, and also even put us in leadership position in Africa and and global. I think. There's nothing I'm, more you can I think I'm cutting, I'm cutting it well. You're cutting it well. Are you I fair think enough? So. I'm asking you this mm -hmm. on the back of the fact that uh, there have yeah. been a uh, lot of questions over mm -hmm. the effectiveness of the approach adopted by Sharj in, in conducting his work, the investigation. Sometimes they say you're yeah. a toothless bulldog. Are you <laughs> firm enough? Sometimes ignorance can be a problem. So this is ignorance. Anyone who says it's, it's, firm, it, it, it's, it's not necessarily ignorant, but sometimes ignorant of what is happening within the institution and what the regulations of the institution require it to do. Right. Now, let me, let me start from... Do you the, get easily intimidated? Oh, I mean... In the course of your work, I have you been, face several I, uh, overtures of intimidation? Never, never. And I must say that very carefully. Right from the Kufo regime up to now, I have no practical experience of any executive authority overreaching their boundaries, their to, boundaries intimidate. to intimidate. No. And I've been there. I've been, I've been in the commission. I've been in leadership 
albeit at different levels. So you didn't just come in in 2016 no, when former president uh, I've seen it all. made you the commissioner? No, 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 no. I was deputy commissioner, legal and investigations, right from 2012. Before then, I was director legal and investigations, 2008 to 2012. What more? What? I mean, what, what more? Before then, I was regional director of the commission. You should be answering that. What more? So what more? What I'm, I think what I want to tell you is you cannot get intimidated. Yeah. Having achieved this level of longevity with the commission and understanding, in fact, understanding and teasing out the full mandate of the commission. Uh, I must say it's, it's during my leadership that the ombudsman role became more pronounced because I, had, I went and made sure I understood it, UK, Scotland and other bodies which are similar to us and then realized that now our oversight role has not really over public services has not really impacted and there's a need for us to have that mandate well, you know, uh, well, 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 well expanded. And that has been done. It has been done. You know, yeah. when we started in the, in, in the course of our conversation, you mentioned uh, investigating the finance ministry, which provides you funding. There are other forms of uh, other uh, types of investigations your mm -hmm. commission is pursuing, um, some are political, the mm -hmm. uh, MPP uh, procurement of uh, vehicles and mm -hmm. uh, several other, the public procurement uh, yeah. authority appearing before you. So mm -hmm. when I ask the question of whether you're firm enough, I am wondering, and I'm sure mm -hmm. many of our viewers are wondering whether mm -hmm. you have what it takes to handle such high profile investigations and still keep your sanity. What it takes? I don't understand it. There are some, there are, to me, there are normal investigations. Uh, the fact that you see them we, as normal, despite no, the fact no, no, that no, no, these I mean, are, you know, agencies which are attached or aligned to the existing government, and you could be called all sorts of names if you no, but I have pursued it. For example, uh, in the investigations of John Dramani Mahama and the mm. pursuit of the Ford vehicles, all sorts of things were said about your personality mm. and your ability to do the job and do it clean. People even wondered whether you did a thorough job enough. Do these things not shake you? They don't shake me because the, the reports are there. And let me correct an impression. At the time of uh, John Draman in Mahama's investigations, I was not the acting commissioner. That report was not signed by me. It was my good friend, Mr. Quayson, the deputy commissioner. So, but of course, we investigated it as a commission. And by the way, you see, people don't, people conflate the way we investigate with that of the courts. No. And without the police service? With that, yeah, there are, there, are, there are nuances, you know, in all, in all of these ones. And we are following our, our regulations. Now, in the area of conflict of interest is a, an interesting and evolving area. And that is why we have insisted and put together, in fact, we've proposed the Conduct of Public Officers Bill, which teases out how conflict of interest is situations under which a public officer can be in conflict of interest. In the absence of legislation, the commission is expected to use its broad discretionary power and within the constitutional, you know, uh, 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 discretion of take appropriate action after we've made findings. That gets people confused. And that is why we are pushing the code, the conduct of public officers bill to come out. Where the law spells out clearly the instances and not only the guidelines of the commission but you get the sense which that we have the, issued. The, public, the conduct of the public officers act, if it does come out, will make any difference. Well, sitting where I sit, I, I think it will make a you lot of difference. It will streamline procurement it lapses. It's going to make it easier for the commission, the authorities of appointees. especially on the conduct of public officers, the conduct element, the ethics, 
and the sanctions that will be applied. That is very critical. We, we, we again, as a people, we don't see recruitment of, uh, you know, um, a relative as, a, as an issue. We think, but that's why I'm there. I'm supposed to be able to support my family. But that's not the case. That is in the bill if you recruit people on the basis of family relations and others, that is a misconduct. That's conflict of interest. That's conflict of interest. If you sit on, uh, you know, a tender committee, uh, knowing that your relative, your father, your mother, your sister, your girlfriend, or your wife's companies are bidding, and you sit on it, it's conflict of interest. So, you see, but because we don't see it in practice, we've come in Ghana to accept that this is normal. Why have I one political power if it is not to make sure that I put my people there? Or why have I gotten into this office if I cannot get a contract for my relative? We take it for granted. Corruption is not, you don't find corruption only through uh, putting people before court. But some of this incipient conduct is what actually then leads to proper grand corruption. So let's look at the way forward yeah. for the fight against corruption. And in there, well, we have a short a few minutes to go. But yeah. I want to look at the way forward for the fight against corruption. Mm -hmm. And within it, uh, whether you get the sense that anti-graft institutions, civil society groups, which are all fighting mm -hmm. corruption alongside mm -hmm. what the state institutions do mm -hmm. are doing well enough? I would say, uh, to the extent that we've been able to galvanize ourselves together, seeing that the corruption fight is not about, oh, charge, oh, Yoko, oh, Auditor General. No. It's all about all of us. Everyone. Everyone. Including the, including the media. Mm -hmm. Let's expose corruption. Let's sensitize the people. Let them know that this is wrong. You cannot go and give a gift. You cannot go and, uh, you know, a, a policeman stops you, you give him money so that you will get your way out. You have a role to play. You don't expect that you will go and pay a bribe and get your way and that anti-corruption or anti-graft bodies are expected to fight corruption. We are all in it if we have to make progress. That's very critical. And I must say, the sensitization on the basis of the NACAP of getting Ghanaians to come to grips that corruption is going to eat us up if we all don't perform our roles seems to be going down very well. And so you think that that's the way forward for everybody to get involved in the fight against corruption? That is the way forward, but again, it's also important to institutionalize efficiency, transparency and accountability in the public service. And how can that be done? I'll give you an example. That is being done. You've heard the Vice President speak a lot about uh, digitization and automation. It's all about making sure that the human factor in public the service, interfaces are removed. the interfaces but are there's removed. there's still challenges with these systems and people are still manipulating them, including the DVLA getting licenses, application for passports. So the digitalization doesn't yeah. appear to be working thoroughly the way it should. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think, of course, there is, there, there's no saint in, in the world, for the saints are all in heaven. So for me, digitization and Ensuring that the human interface is reduced is the, way is the way forward. Automation, making sure that we don't go paying for services is the way. Not only will government get its revenue directly, but at least the bad nuts and the, the, the temptation to, to take something from under the counter would be removed. Mr. Wotel, it's been great uh, having a conversation with you. Thank you so we're much. We're glad that you gave us your time. Thank I'm Stephen and we'll be having an interesting conversation with uh, Joseph Wotel, the Commissioner of the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice. And this is part of the conversations we're having on TV3 with eminent Ghanaians on the fight against corruption. Stay with us.